Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleiss from Central New Mexico Community College and in this video, this rather lengthy video on the epithelial tissues, I'm going to cover the microscope slides of specific epithelial tissues that you're required to know for uh, an anatomy and physiology uh, majors course, uh, especially at our institution. And as I cover these slides, I will point out some interesting and unique features and some major functions and locations of the tissues. In a previous video, you learned about the general features of the epithelial tissue, so I'm not going to recover that. And you also learned how the epithelial tissues are classified on their two criteria, namely the number of cell layers and the shapes of the cells. So with that said, let's get moving and start with the first specific type of epithelial tissue, namely simple squamous epithelial tissue. Simple squamous epithelial tissue is a very abundant tissue. Even though it's a very thin tissue, it is very delicate. Because it's so abundant and pretty widespread, we see that it has many functions. For instance, it um, forms a rather smooth surface on the inside of blood vessels. So all blood vessels have an inner layer of epithelial tissue, which is simple squamous epithelium. We refer to that layer as endothelium. Now we have another area in the serosi of the ventral body cavity where we also find a smooth surface of simple squamous epithelial tissue, but there we refer to that simple squamous epithelial tissue as the mesothelium. And I will readdress these two terms um, in the following slides. Because this tissue is so thin, it can also easily allow for the the diffusion of gases, that is particularly oxygen and carbon dioxide, both in the lungs and across the walls of the tiny little blood capillaries, for instance. Filtration is also a, one of the functions of simple squamous epithelial tissue in the kidneys, where we find something called Bowman's capsules. We'll discuss that too. And then finally, secretion. We've learned about the serosi in the past, and you've learned that in between your visceral and parietal serosa, there is a cavity that is going to be filled with the watery serous fluid, and it is the epithelial cells that are responsible for secreting that serous fluid. So let's get started by looking at simple squamous epithelial tissue that forms the lining of blood vessels. So it doesn't matter what size blood vessel we are looking at, whether it's the biggest blood vessel in your body, such as the aorta, or uh, smaller arteries, or really small arteries called arterioles, or even capillaries, or veins, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what blood vessel we're looking at, every one of them has simple squamous epithelial tissue lining the lumen. And of course, the lumen is very easy to recognize here because it's full of red blood cells. There are also white blood cells in here, but it's very easy to see all these red blood cells that stain red, and um, red blood cells, when they're mature, lack organelles and a nucleus, so they just look like nice pink reddish little blobs. We can recognize this as simple squamous epithelium right here, because when we focus on the nuclei, notice how flat they are. And that's what you'll often have to, to do to identify your epithelial tissues, is to look at the shape of the nuclei. So the tissue name that lines all blood vessels is simple squamous epithelial tissue. But we refer to the layer as endothelium. So you may see a question that asks for what is the tissue that lines blood vessel walls? And then you would say simple squamous epithelial tissue. If on the other hand you are asked 
what is the name of the layer that lines blood vessel walls, your answer would be endothelium. And you can refer to the cells as endothelial cells. So by default, endothelial cells are squamous cells. Now, <clears throat> we like to use that term endothelium because when we use it in a context, it immediately tells the reader, the listener, that we're referring to that inner epithelial lining of any and every blood vessel. We also find this simple squamous epithelial layer on the, lining the inside of lymphatic vessels, as you'll learn more about in AMP2. Here you see a nice high magnification of that same blood vessel. Once again, right here we see the lumen. This is the lumen right here with your red blood cells. And now we can very nicely see those very flattened nuclei of your squamous cells that form your simple squamous epithelial tissue or we can refer to it as the layer called the endothelium. Now, since this is not a capillary, we see beyond the epithelial layer some connective tissue and possibly a little bit of um, um, muscle tissue. Um, in capillaries, however, tiny little capillaries are made up of primarily just this endothelium and basement membrane. So they're very, very thin. As I've said before, there are many examples of locations for simple squamous epithelial tissue. So this time we're going to look at the kidney. And the kidney is also a great example to convince you how important it is to be very specific about where exactly inside of an organ, inside of a viscera, uh, where we find a particular epithelial tissue. For instance, in the kidneys, we find simple squamous epithelial tissue as well as simple cuboidal, as well as simple columnar. So therefore, you can see that you're going to have to learn to be clear and specific about where in the kidney you find um, each one of these epithelial tissues. So let's get started with this low magnification um, of the outer layer of the kidney. I'm going to draw a quick sketch of a kidney here. Let's just draw it right here. There's your kidney. Arising from the kidney is a tube, as you know, that's called the ure ureter, or some people say ureter, that will eventually dump into the bladder. All right. So let's just for now focus on, on the kidney. So the kidney has two major layers to it. And this outer layer here we call the cortex. While this inner layer here we refer to as the medulla. And histologically, these la layers are different, which is actually very easy to see in a kidney that you just slice as well. These two terms, cortex as well as medulla, reappear over and over and over again in many different organs. For instance, your lymph node, your spleen, um, your bones, your long bones in particular, are made up of a cortex and a medulla, which is why I have already introduced you to these terms. Now, in the kidneys, more specifically in this outer layer we call the cortex, that is where we find this particular slide. And by Taking a closer look at the slide, we see all these white circles here. That tells us that we're in the cortex because these little white circles are indicative of a structure we refer to as the renal corpuscles. In anatomy, or actually even in Latin, corpus sol literally means little body. A corpse is a body, so a corpus sol is literally going to mean little body, a term that will come across many, many times in anatomy. So what we're going to do next then is focus on one of these renal corpuscles and learn more about them. So they're all located uh, 
in the cortex. So all these little circles are located right here, these renal corpuscles. So let's go to the next slide. Here then we see a very high magnification of a renal corpuscle. So this whole structure that, that, are, that I'm now encircling is what we call a renal corpuscle. It consists of two parts. The first part is what we call the Bowman's capsule. And that's what we'll focus on uh, for now. So the Bowman's capsule, if I delineate it a little bit better, is more or less illustrated here. It's kind of the shape of a baseball glove. So that's its inner wall and this is its outer wall. Now, of course, I'm kind of covering up that outer wall that we need to take a closer look at. Uh, we'll deal with that in just a moment. On the inside here, the other part, that is a bunch of capillaries. That is lots and lots of capillaries right here. So literally what happens is that our blood is going to enter into these capillaries. Of all the many, many, many renal corpuscles distributed throughout your kidneys, about a million or so in each kidney. And the blood is under pretty high pressure when it arrives here. And that's what's going to allow for the blood to be filtered. Remember that filtration refers to the movement of water and particles across a filtration membrane because of a pressure gradient. So the pressure in the blood that arrives in the kidneys is higher than the pressure on the inside of our capillary beds. And consequently, water and a lot of particles in the blood, not the blood cells, are going to get filtered out to create our filtrate here in this lumen. Now, this is not quite urine yet, but eventually it will become urine, and you'll learn in MP2 how that works. So we'll initially refer to this as filtrate. So this is not quite urine, it's almost urine, but some other things need to be done to it. So why this long explanation? Well, first of all, the filtration membrane is right here at the junction between the capillaries and the inside wall of your Bowman's capsule. So your filtrate moves in this direction from the blood into the Bowman's capsule. I'll abbreviate it as BC. Okay, now we were talking about simple squamous epithelial tissue. The reason for why filtration can easily occur is because where we have this filtration membrane, that is where we have simple squamous epithelial tissue. Remember, all capillaries are made up of simple squamous epithelial tissue, and the inside wall is a bunch of modified epithelial cells. But what, where we can really easily see the simple squamous epithelial cells is in the outer wall of our Bowman's capsule, which I have now covered up with this yellow line, so let me fix this. So I've erased the, the yellow line that covered the outer wall of the Bowman's capsule, and notice the flattened nuclei everywhere. Here, there's a couple of nuclei combined here, 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 etc. So the outer wall of our Bowman's capsule is made up of simple squamous epithelial tissue. So right here is our simple squamous epithelial tissue. So the specific example of another location for simple squamous epithelial tissue is in the wall of our Bowman's capsules. Now on this slide, by the way, we see additional epithelial tissue. For instance, right here and right here, maybe not the best um, views here, but those are tubules in the kidneys that squiggle all over the place. They have a lumen, and I'll show you a better illustration in just a moment, and that lumen is lined with simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. So within the same organ, namely the kidney, 
we now see that there is simple squamous epithelial tissue as well as simple cuboidal. Before we move on to simple cuboidal, we need to also try to learn to visualize simple squamous epithelial tissue from a different viewpoint. So, so far we've looked at the cells from the side. We've sliced through the length of a blood vessel, for instance, or we sliced through a Bowman's capsule and therefore looked onto the simple squamous epithelial tissues from the side. But we can also have a surface view. For instance, imagine that you're in a blood vessel and you're looking around. Let's say you're a red blood cell or white blood cell and you can look around you. Then the squamous cells will actually look like this. They will look like puzzle pieces, like so. Now, to create a slide um, like this, it, it's kind of difficult with a blood vessel because it would mean that we would somehow have to isolate the blood vessel and then uh, open it up to be able to see uh, the surface view. So there's another location in the body that is easier to create a slide with. And that is the, um, the, ventral, the ventral body cavities serosi, right? Um, they're going to be made up of simple squamous epithelial tissue plus a bit of connective tissue. All right, you'll learn more about that connective tissue. So we have just two layers, but remember, uh, two tissue layers together create an organ. So the serosi are very simple organs because of how few tissues uh, make up the serosi. Now it's easy to, you know, take a little piece of a, a membrane called a serous membrane or a serosa from the ventral body cavity and create a slide from it. And then we do get this surface view. And so that's what we see here. Notice that the squamous cells that form the simple squamous epithelial tissue um, are kind of like puzzle pieces or irregularly shaped tiles. The fact that this is simple squamous epithelial tissue also allows us to see the nuclei very clearly. And notice that from this angle, the nuclei are actually quite round. Okay, now let's clarify what we mean by this term mesothelium. So the inner lining of all blood vessels, which is made up of simple squamous epithelial tissue, we call endothelium. But the simple squamous epithelium inside or forming um, the, um, the epithelial layer of your serosi in your ventral body cavity, they, um, or that layer of epithelial tissue, that simple squamous epithelial tissue, we tend to refer to as mesothelium. So this layer of simple squamous epithelial tissue, we can refer to as the mesothelium. And I'll abbreviate because I'm running into my menu of picking different colors. You guys can't see that, but let's just leave it like that. Okay, so remember, you could be asked the question about what kind of tissue is this. You could be asked the question, what is the name of the layer that is created by this tissue? I hope that you're beginning to understand the difference between these two questions. When you're asked for a tissue name, you need to stick to your nomenclature. In other words, you need to stick to uh, the classification system of your tissues. And that is for the epithelial tissues, numbers of cells, cell layers, I'm sorry, shapes of cells, and then you have your two oddball tissues um, that will come to in just a moment that still belong to either the simple or the stratified epithelial tissues. There are more examples of simple squamous epithelial tissue, by the way. For instance, the walls of the little air sacs of the lungs called the alveoli are also made up of just simple squamous epithelial tissue which makes it so much easier for oxygen and carbon dioxide to cross um, their walls. But let's move on to simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue typically has two major functions. 
Um, either the cells are involved in secreting materials or they might be involved in absorbing materials. And in the kidneys, we often refer to it as reabsorption. Uh, I'm not going to go into the difference between absorption and reabsorption. At this point, you'll get a better understanding of this in AMP2. Really, the two processes mean the exact same thing if we take a look at exactly in which direction particles and water move. In absorption uh, in, or in reabsorption in the kidneys, we'll see that particles and water will move from the lumen of tubules into uh, the blood. All right. Clearly, um, little glands are going to be able to create secretions, and those secretions will then follow little ducts such that they the ducts can dump the secretion uh, either on the outside of the body, as in the case of sweat, or saliva is dumped into our, into our mouth, for instance. Our thyroid gland has these little round structures we call follicles. They're lined with simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. These follicles are responsible for the making of thyroid hormone. And then the surface of the ovaries also are covered with simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. So these are some major regions of examples of simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, I guess I should give it its title here, is one of the easiest tissues to recognize uh, under a microscope. And here we see a, a generalized image so right here is the lumen, and when you see a lumen, always remember the first tissue that we come across, the tissue that always touches the lumen, is going to be our epithelial tissue. So this right here, this layer, this single layer of cells with gigantic round nuclei is our simple cuboidal layer. Notice the spelling of cuboidal, it's not cuboidal. It's cuboidal. And again, these big, round, dark nuclei are very characteristic. And the single layer rests on connective tissue that is going to be vascularized. Here we're back in the kidneys. And we could be in the cortex um, nearby all of these renal corpuscles that we studied earlier. As a matter of fact, these Bowman's capsules, remember they're the shape of a baseball glove and you stick your hand in a baseball glove, right? So the hand is the Bowman's capsule and your arm represents one of these tubules. And they're very tiny little tubules and very lengthy, but they're very squiggly. In other words, they coil upon themselves inside of the cortex. When we slice through them, they look like this. So here we see the lumen of these tubules that have the filtrate in them. So from the Bowman's capsule, the filtrate is passed on into the lumen of these little tubules in the kidneys. And these cells, these epithelial cells, are going to literally manipulate this filtrate, remove some of the, the nutrients or some of the particles, I should say, that are in that filtrate, remove some of the water and carry it into the connective tissue, which remember always sits nearby our epithelial tissue where there is blood. So that would be your example of absorption or in the kidneys, we tend to call it reabsorption. And little by little, this filtrate becomes um, a liquid that is water with mostly waste products. Notice the single layer of cells with big round nuclei resting on a basement membrane. This is a beautiful slide. Here we see the beginning of another tubule. And all of this right here, assume that that is connective tissue, um, even though it's not easy to see. Here we're looking at a slide, a very high magnification, I should say, of 
the thyroid gland and in the thyroid gland we have these big round roundish structures with this pink stuff inside right here this is basically where your thyroid hormone is eventually made again in amp2 you will learn more details with the help of your simple cuboidal epithelial cells which are located here so all of these nuclei these big round nuclei again belong to a layer of simple maybe not that one as much um, let's point to a better one belong to a layer of simple cuboidal epithelial tissue now let's take a look at simple columnar epithelial tissue it too functions primarily in absorption and secretion. So notice that these two functions kind of overlap with simple cuboidal and even simple squamous. What's interesting about simple columnar epithelial tissue is that very often the apical surface of the cells may have either microvilli or cilia, not both. It's either microvilli or cilia. Remember what the difference is between these two. In the case of microvilli, we're going to see that the cell's membrane is convoluted and this of course increases the surface area. In the case of micro I'm sorry, in the case of cilia, we see that there are just little hairs sticking out of the cells. Your book's pictures are sometimes misleading in that they pretty much use the same illustrations for microvilli and cilia. Um, so be careful. Cilia are going to typically function in moving things along, while microvilli, because they increase the surface area, are going to function primor primarily in absorption. In addition to either microvilli or cilia being present as a special feature, we might also see something called goblet cells. And goblet cells are modified columnar cells that have become specialized into secreting mucus. So literally, these are cells that function as glands. So we'll look at those. If we want to specify where we find either the ciliated versus the non-ciliated versions of simple columnar epithelial tissue, in areas where we need lots of absorption, it would make sense that we uh, will find the non-ciliated version. Um, but in the intestines, we'll see the version with lots of microvilli. While the ciliated version of simple columnar epithelial tissue, we will see in some parts of your respiratory tract and even in the genitourinary tract of the male. So here then we're looking at simple columnar epithelial tissue. You can see the very cellular tissue here with the lengthy cells and the nuclei also being kind of elliptical in shape. Here we see a funny looking cell that is actually one of those goblet cells. We'll see better pictures of that in just a moment. This fuzzy portion near the top near the ap or on the apical surface of the cells uh, are microvilli. Again, a little difficult for you to see here. And then we see the basement membrane here of our simple columnar epithelial tissue as well as here. So all of this here represents connective tissue. All of that is connective tissue. But what are we really looking at? So let me explain this better. We're actually in the small intestine. And so this is where we need to go look at my little drawing here in the top left. So this is a cross section of your small intestine. Here's its lumen. And notice that the wall of the small intestine is not perfectly circular. It is kind of convoluted, right? And then there's even more convolutions as we go to uh, take a look at a, a little section of the small intestine under the microscope. So here I've taken a chunk out of the wall of the small intestine and this little stretch here in the blue represents these columnar epithelial cells and notice that collect collectively they form these 
fingers. So these fingers are actually here also formed by this blue layer. So there we see yet another level of increasing the surface area. And then we also can assume that each one of these cells has microvilli, right? So these are the microvilli on the actual picture. So if we now try to better understand what we're looking at here. So we have our simple columnar epithelial tissue forming what we refer to as villi. That's the name of those finger-like structures. So this right here is equal to a villus. Plural would be villi. And these villi that are made up of simple columnar epithelial tissue also contain connective tissue. So all of these epithelial cells are fed by the capillaries in the connective tissue inside of these villi. And we continue to see more connective tissue here as well, and then eventually some muscle tissue and nervous tissue, etc. So this is going further down into the wall towards the periphery of the wall of the small intestine. So hopefully this will help you better understand now what we're looking at here. So if I focus on these cells here, that's what we're seeing here. And so then here's that connective tissue, here's that connective tissue, here we see the other side of that villus right here. So you see a small section of this villus here. Okay. Here then we see again simple squamous epithelial tissue, but in a different location. This could be um, in some of the bronchi, which are the branches of the trachea. And this time we do not see microvilli, but we clearly see hairs, right? So notice that this apical surface really shows nice little hairs unlike in the previous slide where the apical surface looked very fuzzy. So when you can see distinct little hairs, then we're sure we're dealing with cilia. And more than likely, we're looking at the lining of bronchi, which is the plural version of bronchus. Here we're back in the intestine. And this time on the slide, which is again a portion of a villus, this time we can actually, here is the villus, here is one villus and this is the beginning of another villus. This time we can very nicely see those goblet cells. And they're called goblet cells because of their shape. We can definitely see it in both of these in the sense that they're shaped literally like a goblet. Remember a goblet has a stem, kind of like so, and then there is this portion of the goblet. And so um, we're, see we're seeing more or less the stem here and then the goblet there. We can't see the nucleus very well of these cells because the organelles and the nucleus are pretty much displaced by the large amounts of mucus that is present inside of these cells. And mucus requires lots of protein synthesis, so there are actually a lot of ribosomes present because mucus is made up of a protein called mucin or mucin plus a bunch of water. So in order to make that protein, we need lots of ribosomes, okay? So this is right here are um, lumen, and therefore here we see, or we can assume that we're seeing the microvilli, which by the way, we would also have on these goblet cells. What is the function of these goblet cells? Well, the mucus is going to hold the food particles together and also allows the food to slither down the intestines a little bit easier. And again, here we see an image showing lots of goblet cells. This image is a little bit better, uh, although this image shows them as well. 
There's one more thing I should have mentioned um, with regards to simple columnar epithelial tissue, and that is more often than not, not the nuclei are more or less lined up in a row. Maybe this slide is not as perfect as many other slides of simple columnar epithelial tissue, but more often than not, these elliptical shaped nuclei line up really nicely. And so here we see a nice diagram of a typical goblet cell. And notice that here we have all the little vesicles that are stuffed with the protein called mucin. And in order to make a protein, we need lots of ribosomes, usually attached to rough endoplasmic reticulum. The Golgi apparatus is going to be quite numerous as well because the Golgi apparati are going to package up all the protein into these vesicles. And then here we see the microvilli. The nucleus is pushed way, way towards the bottom of the cell and often we can't even see it very well because it's actually very often really narrow in shape. Now there is this oddball tissue. I call them an oddball um, because there's two of these oddball tissues. And one of these oddball tissues is still a simple epithelial tissue. And we refer to it as pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. And often we get lazy and we just abbreviate it as PCCE. It's almost always ciliated. Um, there are some versions that are not ciliated, but almost always it is. So let's just give it its complete name of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. Now, all of you know that the prefix pseudo, as in pseudonym, means false, right? Authors often use a pseudonym, meaning a fake name. And so why does this tissue get that term? Well, <clears throat> or the term pseudostratified, well, clearly it, it must not be truly stratified. And what we'll see is that all the cells actually touch the basement membrane. Or if we have a good slide and a good microscope, we should be able to see that. The fact that the cells are different heights there makes the nuclei line up pretty randomly. And that misleads us into thinking we're looking at a stratified columnar tissue, which it isn't. And so we call it pseudostratified. This is a tissue that is um, the, 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 the location that you definitely need to know about is the trachea because that's or the lining of the trachea. So that is where we um, will find that ciliated version of this PCCE. We see some of the non-ciliated version, version in um, some of the sperm carrying ducts in the male, as you'll learn more about in AMP2. So let's take a look at a picture now. So for this tissue, for PCCE, really, if you know that it occurs or forms the lining of our trachea, which is our windpipe, that is sufficient at this point in time. So we're looking at a pretty low magnification here. We, here we see the trachea of a small mammal more than likely. Here's the lumen, of course, that would be filled with air. And this is an example of an organ, unlike most other organs, that is always going to stay to have an a very round lumen. In other words, it's important for your trachea to always be patent. That is the term that is used, patent, meaning standing open so that air can flow in and out without any uh, major obstruction. And so if we assume that here we have the lumen, then of course we can therefore automatically deduct that this very first layer there that looks so dark and um, cellular is our pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. You also see some glands here, and this is um, the cartilage that you feel when you rub your hand up and down your trachea. In this picture, we're really zooming in onto the wall of the trachea. Once again, here we see the cartilage. You'll learn more about that uh, when we get to the connective tissue and some um, 
uh, other connective tissue here, onto which our pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue rests. And you can barely see the lighter pink cells. Those are lots and lots and lots of goblet cells that form part of our PCCE. Now, why do we want goblet cells? Well, they can, with the help of their mucus, they secrete, trap any kinds of foreign particles that are like dust particles that are trying to get into our lungs. And what we see here, this is a low magnification, so it's difficult. These are actually cilia. From there, the term pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. And they're going to help with moving any particles that are trying to get into our lungs via the trachea, moving them back up towards um, the mouth. Here then we're looking at a very high magnification, um, so high we might almost get lost in this picture. So let me get you a bit oriented. Right here, this is the apical surface. And here we see the cilia arising from the apical surface. So our basement membrane is down below here. This is where the basement membrane is. Notice that the nuclei are kind of all over the place. And this is what makes it difficult sometimes to identify this tissue as pseudostratified. This is a very high magnification with a pretty poor resolution. Um, this would not be a slide I would easily give you to and ask you to identify. Um, I'm just using this to really illustrate how the nuclei are all over the place. Let's now move into the stratified uh, epithelial tissue. So, so far with regards to the simple epithelial tissues, you learned four. You learned about simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar, and then the oddball pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. Within the stratified squamous epithelial tissues, we're going to focus on just two. Uh, even though there are four. Um, the other two we will just barely mention. They're not extremely common. We'll get to them in just a moment. Let's first focus on stratified squamous epithelial tissue. This tissue is pretty distinct in, in, in what it looks like in the sense that it typically has many, many layers of cells and close to the apical surface the cells become flattened, which is why we call it a squamous tissue. The cells near the basal surface may not be flat, so don't be distracted by them. When you see many layers of cells in a tissue, always look at the cells closer to the apical surface. If they are flattened, you're dealing with stratified squamous epithelial tissue. The function of stratified squamous epithelial tissue is to protect us, protect us from abrasion, from friction. And therefore, it is the layer that makes up the most superficial layer of, or this is the tissue, I'm sorry, that makes up the most superficial layer of our skin. That superficial layer of our skin is called the epidermis. So the epidermis is made up of stratified squamous epithelial tissue, our hair, our nails. And you'll see that these areas have a, uh, a portion of that stratified squamous epithelial tissue that is literally dead because it is hardened with a protein called keratin. So we refer to that kind of stratified squamous epithelial tissue as keratinized. But we have other areas where there's a lot of friction. The inside of your mouth that continues into your esophagus is very much exposed to the friction of all the food that we put in our mouth. So the lining of your mouth, the lining of your esophagus is also going to have this thick layer of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And even some other areas, there's friction in the vagina and even um, the anal canal and also the opening of the urethra will have some of the stratified squamous epithelial tissue that is non-keratinized. So you don't have any hardening of the cells in these areas. Here we're looking at uh, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Let me make sure that you remember that's what we're looking at. That is not keratinized. 
In other words, we're not going to see um, dead cells near the apical surface. And often um, when we don't have this tissue keratinized, there aren't quite as many layers. But still, we have for sure more than two layers. And it's always easy to pick out your epithelial tissue because it's very crowded with nuclei, very crowded with cells, therefore it always stains really dark. Not only that, here is our um, lumen or our free, um, our free surface area, so therefore you can tell again that this is your epithelial tissue with this area right here with clearly a lot less nuclei, the connective tissue. Notice that the cells in the basal layer actually have nuclei that almost look round. Be careful. When you see many layers of cells, what do you do? You look near the apical surface. So this right here, this region closer to the apical surface is what you should be focusing on. And notice that your nuclei are definitely looking much more flattened. Here we're looking at the, the skin with this being the stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And remember in the skin we call that the epidermis. While all of this is connective tissue, we call that the dermis. So when we scratch ourselves to where we only scratch off some of these dead cells here, or even go into the living cells there, we're not going to bleed because remember, epithelial tissues are avascular. If, however, we end up here in the connective tissues, there we do have blood vessels. And um, if, for instance, a nail or a splinter makes it into the connective tissue, uh, we do bleed. So this layer here looks quite dead. And it almost looks like this would be the basement membrane, but it isn't. Remember, we need to look for where we have our basal layer of our epithelial tissue. Where is the last layer that looks very cellular? And once again, we can focus on the cells in the basal layer to identify this tissue. We have to look closer to the surface, which means that we're looking now in this area here. Let me use a different color. We should be looking in this area about here. And then clearly our cells are so flat that um, because they're dead and even here, these cells are starting to look much more flattened. Here we're looking at the esophagus with the lumen of the esophagus right here. What lines the lumen? Epithelial tissue. So on this picture, all of this dark tissue up to about here is our stratified squamous epithelial tissue. The esophagus is a hollow organ. If there's no food in it, notice that once again, it's going to look very convoluted, uh, the opening, the lumen. Um, if we go beyond the epithelial tissue, we get to a bunch of connective tissue and you learn later on that this is all muscle tissue and it's bright red like that it tends to be muscle tissue. And finally here we're looking at a nice slide of the vaginal canal. We see the thickness of the tissue of the stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Remember, we're still looking at stratified squamous epithelial tissue, which we always find where there is friction. It is very easy to recognize this layer here as the basal layer because of how dark the nuclei stain. Remember, lots of mitotic divisions there that then uh, result in cells, new daughter cells that can migrate upward and replace the cells that flake off here right, because of abrasion, because of friction, all these cells of stratified squamous epithelial tissue very easily flake off. We focus on the cells in the apical surface and we see that their nuclei are very flat and that helps us conclude that we're looking at stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Just the mere thickness, that is the numbers of layers, is also a big giveaway.
Now, as I said earlier, there are a couple of stratified epithelial tissues that we're just going to mention here, but we're not going to really spend a whole lot more time on them. Uh, I will not test you on them in any great detail except for what is listed on, these, on this particular slide. I will not ever ask you to identify them in AMP1. Now, when you go into AMP2, you will very easily start recognizing these two stratified tissues. They're just not extremely common, and so uh, we don't really need to spend a whole lot of time on them. At any rate, so there's stratified cuboidal, which is usually just a couple of cell layers thick, you know, which again helps you to easily distinguish it from stratified squamous, which is always many layers. And we find it in the ducts of many of our sweat glands and even our uh, mammary glands, the glands that produce um, milk. So it's a, a rare tissue along with the stratified columnar, which is pretty rare. I've listed some examples of locations here, so be sure that you memorize those. Um, and that's about all you need to know about these two tissues for now. That brings us to our last tissue, which is our second oddball. And it is actually an oddball. I'll just put here in, in parentheses oddball because it doesn't follow the nomenclature of um, getting a name with either simple or stratified in it or secondly, a squamous, columnar, or cuboidal. It has its own unique name and that is transitional. Just like we had the other oddball and that is your pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. Now, your pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue was placed in the simple epithelial tissues because all of those columnar cells actually touch the basement membrane. Transitional epithelial tissue, on the other hand, is made up of multiple layer of cell, layers of cells. So by, um, because of how we classify the epithelial tissues, this is really a stratified tissue, right? Hope you guys... Um, agree with that. So why is it called transitional? Why get, does it get that name? Well, it has the ability of going from multiple cell layers, four, five, six cell layers, to three cell layers, or maybe even less, when the organ is stretched. And, and where do we find this? Well, this has a very, you know, specific location, and that is we find it in the lining of the bladder and the ureters. Remember, those are the tubes that leave the kidneys and dump the urine into the bladder. And a little bit, we see a little bit of it in the urethra, particularly where the bladder gives, gives rise to the urethra. So allow me to make a quick sketch here. So if we have our kidney here and we have our other kidney here, Remember, each one of them gives rise to a ureter. Here are the ureters, drawn a little bit too wide. Here's our bladder, which I should have drawn much bigger. Um, so these are the two ureters. And then arising from the bladder in the male, much longer than in the female, we have the urethra. Right In the male, the urethra is located in the penis. And so nearby the bladder, the urethra would still have transitional. So we have transitional epithelium lining the ureters or ureters, the bladder and a portion of the urethra. And so particularly when these structures are stretched due to the presence of urine, and, and the bladder is a good example of this, we find that the cells, the epithelial cells, must be able to um, stretch along with the pushing of the urine up against the wall without the cells losing contact. And uh, this epithelial tissue has the ability to do that by transitioning from multiple layers of cells to uh, fewer layers of cells. Now, this is a tissue that is easily confused with stratified um, columnar. So let me make that note here. No, I'm sorry, it's easily confused with stratified squamous. My apologies. 
and I'll explain to you why in just a moment. And I'll discuss here um, the cuboidal cells versus the dome-shaped cells on the picture that we'll take a look at. So here we're looking at a relaxed bladder, which is again going to be kind of folded up on the inside, which is why the lumen is here, and we see wall here as well as there. Those are two apical surfaces, right? Again, if I make a quick little drawing here in the top right corner, if I make a cross section of the bladder when it's relaxed, it'll look like this on the inside, right? With L here being the lumen. That's where the urine would be. When it fills up with urine, this inner wall will start to stretch out. And so here we see our transitional epithelial tissue. Uh, more than likely right about here is where the connective tissue starts. And what you notice is that the nuclei stay pretty elliptical or round all the way towards the apical surface. So we do not see any flattening of the nuclei. On the next slide, I'll show you that the surface, the apical surface of these cells is, remains dome-shaped. I enlarged this image so much to where I lost some of the details, um, but we should see this a little bit better in the next slide. So here we see the lumen again, L4, the lumen of the bladder, or it could be the ureters. And now we do see the dome shape, shaped apical surface of the cells right here. Also notice these very round nuclei. Now, this is typical for a relaxed bladder and a uh, even a, a ureter that's not stretched much by urine. So when the stretching occurs, the dome shape does start to vanish somewhat. Um, for this level of a class, I will typically show you a bladder slide, a ureter slide that is relaxed, that is not being stretched, so that you can see those dome shapes or certainly those round nuclei. And so this was our last tissue. So we have looked at all of the epithelial tissues. Um, there are just a couple of the stratified epithelial tissues that we didn't look at in any great detail. So for those, you just have to know what is on that one slide. And those two tissues are the stratified columnar and stratified cuboidal. All the other epithelial tissues you need to be able to identify you need to be able to list very specific locations inside of organs. For instance, the lining of the bladder or forms the wall of Bowman's capsules in kidneys, right? Um, you also need to know their functions and you also need to know um, their unique features, which I have um, expanded on quite extensively in each one of the slides. So hopefully this helps you prepare better for your upcoming exam on the epithelial tissues.